so this year's theme really touches on uh, sort of the heart of what the Middle East Institute is all about and also about uh, touches on the interests of the Middle East Institute, indeed its raison d'etre, which is the connection between the Middle East and Southeast Asia and beyond. Um, and these connections, these transnational networks, of course, operate on multiple levels. It's not just about government to government. It's not just economics. Um, it operates from above. It operates from below. Uh, there's a dimension of history there. There's cultural exchanges uh, and so forth. And I think that this year's theme really sort of touches on all of these facets. Uh, so as a form of transnational connectivity, transnational charity networks operate, as we will see throughout the day, uh, on a governmental level, on an economic level, again, from above, from below, uh, on an individual level, ideological level, and so forth. So politically speaking, uh, transnational charities uh, have had a two-way impact. It's not just a case of the Middle East imposing uh, frames of reference on uh, 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 Southeast Asia. There is a sort of a to and fro. There's two-way traffic there. From a Middle East perspective, uh, politically speaking, transnational charities have proven to be an important legitimating factor for various regimes in, in the Gulf uh, that have been involved in these efforts, primarily places like Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and perhaps to a lesser extent, the United Arab Emirates. Um, so charity has proven to be a key chip in the region's attempts to extend its soft power in Southeast Asia, and has been an entry point with which to build alliances within uh, Southeast Asia as well. Uh, I was very interested to hear that the Emir of Kuwait uh, was given the official title, according to my um, colleague Zoltan, uh, the official title of Qa'id al-Amal al-Insani, meaning the commander of humanitarian work. And what was even more interesting was, if I got this correctly, the uh, title was actually bestowed upon him by the United Nations. Um, so that really, for me, sort of underlined how much capital and how much currency, how much political currency there is to the efforts of these transnational charity networks. The economic dimension, of course, I think is, uh, is very obvious. Uh, charity has been a tried and tested entry point to business in Southeast Asia and vice versa as well. Uh, there is that interconnectivity comes out from these economic uh, linkages. Again, so it's not just the Middle Eastern imposition. So for example, Kuwait would buy land in Cambodia uh, to assure its own food security and thereby creating another level of connectivity out of charities. So the charity networks create another level of interdependence and another level of transnational relations. Transnational charities have of course uh, developed into an industry in and of themselves, employing tens of thousands of people from multiple nationalities, thereby creating global networks, not just Southeast Asian and Middle East. Um, global networks whose cohesion is underlined by professional identity, by shared values, religious identity, ideology, and economic interest as well. And it's a very dynamic, very competitive field. Again, something that's gonna come up today uh, in several of the papers, uh, competitive within the Middle East and also here in Southeast Asia. Um, so we'll be looking at things like the impact on recipient countries, the dynamics underpinning transnational charity networks, um, the impact that they've had in social, political, religious, and economic terms here in Southeast Asia, how have charity networks impacted conceptions of Islamic orthodoxy and conceptions of Muslim identity in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, uh, and how have communities here reconciled the contradictions between Middle Eastern uh, uh, um, variants of Islamic orthodoxy with local, older Islamic traditions. So these will be some of the main questions that we'll be uh, looking at. Um, I will end with, uh, add my comments with uh, my thanks first, in case I don't get a chance to say this later on, my thanks first of all to my colleague Zoltan who was uh, uh, invaluable in, in, in helping me organize 
uh, this, this event. It's far more his field than it is mine. Um, and my thanks, of course, to Huda as well, who's not in the room. Uh, finally, some housekeeping facilities are right and right again. Uh, there's coffee outside and some nibbles. We're going to start with panel one, break for lunch, panel two ending around 4.30 or thereabouts. So without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, Alberto Perez Perero. He is the general manager of Breogan Consulting, where he has worked on projects concerning Khmer language uh, education, Cham language script, and cultural and social development. He received his PhD in anthropology at Arizona State University for research conducted amongst the Muslims of Cambodia and uh, research into the intersection of historical memory and Islamic identity in Cambodia. Uh, and today he'll be talking about conversion failure, the obstacle of local culture in Dawa in Cambodia. Uh, Alberto, 20 minutes, 25 if it's an emergency, but 20 is, is the target. Um, so just very quickly, uh, for people that have seen my presentations before, there's always the first couple of slides that are the same, but uh, the Cham of Cambodia are represented in uh, green here on the map. And the Cham are a uh, mostly Muslim minority living in Cambodia. Cambodia is about, Cambodia is the most uh, ethnically and religiously homogeneous country in Southeast Asia. It's about uh, 88 to 92 percent Khmer Buddhist. Uh, but there's a, a percentage, about four to five percent, uh, that are Muslims. And of that percentage, about 75 percent are Cham-speaking Muslims. That means that they, they speak a language other than Khmer at home. And these are people who are descendants from um, what was once known as Champa, which is this area of central Vietnam, where as, this, as the Vietnamese state expanded over centuries, they were gradually uh, taken over, and many of them were not so much expelled, but they didn't want to live under that regime anymore, and so then they moved to Cambodia. So now uh, there's hundreds of thousands of uh, Cham people who are living in Cambodia as a result of these historic migrations. Um, one thing that's very important is that the Cham, uh, especially during that period that you saw on the map, uh, uh, had not yet converted to Islam. Uh, today, most Cham are Muslim of some type or another, but there was a pre-Islamic version um, of Cham culture, much like you find in uh, Indonesia or Malaya or or, or, or Bali today, which was uh, a form of Brahmanism that was being practiced. And so a lot of the questions about uh, who is a real Muslim or who is practicing mu Islam correctly um, often turn into questions of uh, who has really c come all the way and who is maybe still preserving uh, traditions from the ancestors that are no longer proper uh, for Muslim people to practice. Um, there are several Muslim groups in Cambodia. What I do here is I, I put in bold the ones that we'll be talking about. Uh, there's a, a rough distinction between Orthodox and non-Orthodox Muslims. And in Cambodia, Orthodox Muslims just means you pray five times a day. Okay, that's basically it. Some of the, some of the, mo the words that I, that I will say have special Cambodian Muslim meanings that are different from what you would mean in the Middle East. Um, so Orthodox Muslims pray five times a day, uh, and they're Sunnis. Uh, there al there's also some Shia, there's some Ahmadiyya, there's just very small groups. There's another group called the Imam San, they do not pray five times a day. I'll be talking about them. Um, there's also different ethnicities. There's the Cham, who I just talked about. There's another group called the Chfia, who are descended from Malay traders, who live mostly in the south of Cambodia. They don't speak Malay anymore, they just speak Khmer. So they're effectively Mus they're, they're Khmer-speaking Muslims. Then there are Khmers who have converted to Islam. That's, that will be important today. And so just a little on the Imam San group. <coughs> the Imam San group is a group of people, they do consider themselves to be Muslims, uh, although many of the other Muslim groups consider them to be very deviant, very unorthodox, or even non-Muslim at all. Um, some of the things that make them different is um, the, the, the first thing that, that, that people talk about is that they pray once a week. They pray once a week on Fridays at noon. Uh, and even then they don't all pray, they have a special class of people who pray. So this is very uh, indicative of a, of a, of a Brahmanistic p uh, past. They have, a, they have a cast of people who do the praying for the community. Um, 
And the, the, these are two mosques. Uh, this is the Imam San Mosque at Sramame, and then this is uh, a pre-Civil War mosque, Wuliya Tom. This is not an Imam San community, but you can see that uh, before the Cambodian Civil War and before the 1990s, when more influence came in from the Middle East than from Malaysia, that uh, ca Cambodian Muslims were building mosques in, in, in styles that are very similar to the way that, they that Buddhists would build uh, temples. I mean, this is what, it, it's, it's very similar architectural uh, style. So, um, and, and this used to be much more common uh, throughout the country. Um, and then just w one point that's important, sometimes when you look at Imam San in the media or online or in newspaper articles, uh, they're talked about as resisting conversion or resisting Islam. This is not exactly the, the, the case. Uh, the Imam San are very attached to their tradition and to their heritage and to their language. And, th and they consider themselves Muslims who want to also work with other Muslims, but who don't want to... Um, alter some of the basic terms of cooperation, basically their, their, their essential culture. So it's, it's not as antagonistic as sometimes it's made to seem uh, in the media, or it doesn't need to be. Um, here's the village that we'll be talking about. Here's the old Sarau, uh, and a Sarau is a prayer house. So it's one step down from a mosque. And the reason this can't be a mosque is because it's made out of wood. And once, w there used to be wooden mosques, but then people discovered concrete and then they said, okay, no, real mosques have to be made out of concrete. So it's a status distinction uh, now in Cambodia. So, so these things that, buildings that used to be mosques have been demoted uh, to, to Surau status. Um, and so this was built in 1999. And of course it's considered uh, less, less prestigious than, than having one made out of concrete. So when a, when a donor or somebody from abroad comes and says, hey, uh, I'm interested in building you a mosque, People are often very interested in that. Uh, and this is what prayers look like at a Imam San community. It happens uh, once a week, and you see that there are older people and then younger people. And the, the younger people actually should be over here. I kind of uh, put that in reverse. Um, and then they have this uh, prayer once a week on Fridays, and then they share a communal meal uh, with the community. And that's, that's basically it. There's a, a number of other restrictions to prayer. So Imam Zans, for example, only pray in their own mosques. They don't pray in other people's mosques. So Imam San, this is why, for example, uh, the, the, the Hakim can't leave his mosque uh, because he has to maintain prayers there. So he has to stay, stay there the whole time. And to pray in another person's mosque is considered sort of improper. Okay, so there's a cast of characters here. Um, there's, there's four of them to keep straight. One is uh, the Sot, who is a Khmer convert. Okay, so he converts from uh, Buddhism to Islam through marriage, uh, and he becomes very, very devout. Uh, there's Haji Sali, who is a Cham American. He never appears physically, but he's sort of a deus ex machina, who provides some of the money that allows uh, these things to happen. He makes contributions, including uh, a madrasa, uh, or a small schoolhouse by the old mosque. Then there are two characters in the village. Uh, there's uh, Bilal, who was formerly an Imam San, but who became very frustrated. He, he was very unhappy with his status in the community and his lack of influence and his lack of, you know, people didn't see his leadership potential or whatever. Um, he ends up joining the Salafi Mosque when the money comes in. And then there's the Hakim of the KT village, who has to basically keep everything together. Uh, Hakim in Cambodia just means the imam of a mosque. It's an imam attached to a mosque. Some imams are like floating imams, uh, and, then, and then some imams are attached to mosques, and those are Hakims. <coughs> so the story basically is like this. The Saud uh, approaches the community because he had, he had a setback. There was a, a problem with his cattle business. He takes cattle, he buys them in Cambodia, he takes them to Thailand, and he sells them there. Um, something happened, I think a couple of his cows died or something like that, I'm not, not sure. Uh, but he asked the community to pray uh, that his business would get better. His business did get better, okay? So his business did improve. So he returns to the village bearing gifts. And he doesn't really have that many gifts of his own, but what he, what he does have is a contact. He has um, a contact in Phnom Penh <coughs> named Haji Mal, and Haji Mal can talk to Haji Sali in the United States 
who can bring money in. Now, what's important here is that nobody in, 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 uh, in KT Village knows who Haji Sali is. They just heard of him, but they've never met him. And even Haji Mal, they never meet him. Everything is going through this one man, uh, Tassot. And at the time, there were no demands made on changes of practice. So effectively, these are just altruistic uh, donations of money. These are altruistic donations of a, a two-classroom uh, two, uh, two schoolhouse. And everything seems just fine. This is 2010. Uh, by 2013, um, a, so Malaysians start appearing. So one of the things that happens is that once some people show up, other people show up because they bring their friends, they tell their friends. It's sort of like viral marketing. Uh, you can come and visit this village uh, and you can, you can do something. You can do something good. You can build a well. You can give some money. You can give some kurban. You can do this, 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 this. And so money starts coming in in this way and people become a, you know, a, a community that never had this kind of income suddenly has a, a stream of income that they never had. And some people are not happy with the way that the Hakim is uh, distributing the money. Okay. Then the next year in 2014, um, there is a decision that there would be a contribution to make a real mosque, not a wooden sural, but a proper mosque. But now there's going to be conditions. <coughs> the, cur the, the current sural has to be demolished, so they have to knock it down. Um, everyone has to st start praying five times a day, and then every man has to be recircumcised. Re I will explain. Okay. Um, and when this happens, Bilal breaks away from the Hakim with about 20 families, and he installs himself at a new mosque. So one of the things that happens in Cambodia is very typically conversions to one kind of Islam or another, to one sect or another, is not an individual matter. It's done in a group. It's done usually in, in, in a family block group. It's, 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 it's very rarely done by just single individuals. Um, and so then it gets real because in 2015, the Minister of Cults and Religions, and it is Cults and Religions, not Culture and Religions, it's, it's, that's what it's called. Um, arranged for uh, circumcisions to be carried out in Kontanaut. They usually bring medical teams in from Malaysia uh, to, to perform these. And so there was resistance against this, uh, and then, uh, but the ministry insisted that if they wanted to be recognized and if they wanted the mosque to be recognized, remember that all this happens under a special ministry of the government. So if you, if you open up your own mosque and just say like, hi, I have a mosque, but you don't have a permit from the government, you don't have a real mosque. You need a permit from the government to have a real mosque or to operate a real mosque. You can have something called a mosque. People you know, will leave you alone, but you won't have any of the benefits of being attached to the state system. Um, and so apparently, according to this story, is what the Hakim did was he organized a reception for the surgical team, but then had boys from nearby villages come in order to be circumcised rather than the boys from KT Village itself. I put a asterisk there because it has to be independently confirmed by a few things. I have a, a couple of different reports, but they're on the same side. It's a little bit too much like Aesop's fable, where like the tortoise outsmarts the fox, and then he keeps the Big Mac all for himself. Uh, you know, but something like this did happen. In other words, there was a team that went up there. They did perform some circumcisions, but it seems like the circumcisions were, per were performed on, on boys other than boys that lived at KT. So, I mean, there's a bunch of questions here, like, couldn't these people just ask, hey, do you live here? Or where are your parents? Or these things are not happening. So one thing you're gonna see here is there's a total lack of communication between the people receiving money and the people giving money, between recipient and donor. Um, community members are distressed by the split, okay? It makes people really nervous when a community breaks up. Um, a lot of uh, communal rituals and religious rituals are meant to be done together and they're meant to enforce solidarity. And if, if, if 20 families just suddenly leave, that's a breakdown in solidarity, okay? Both the Hakim and Bilal insist everything is fine. And that's really important because religious positions of this type in, in, in Cambodia are not just religious, they're also political. Um, if the government thinks that you are losing control of your followers, the government will come and replace you with a new imam or a new hakim because they need you to keep all your people together so when the elections come, everybody votes the right way. And sometimes, very often, when people split, they don't just split religiously, they also split politically. So they'll go from CPP, which is the ruling party, to CNRP, which 
is now an illegal party, but for a while that was the dominant uh, opposition party. So there's a political uh, thing here, and neither Hakim or Bilal want anybody outside the village to know that there's a split in the community. Um, in 2015, the do donations start to dry up. People lose interest, they move on to other things, okay? Uh, people in the village seem to think that the kurban would go on forever. Uh, they used to have enough kurban for everybody in the village. Now there's only three or four cows, it's not enough. Uh, people become very despondent. And effectively there is a protest, there's a small sort of revolution in the community, led mostly by women and young people. Uh, young, young, young men, uh, but, and also the women who basically just want to go back to the old ways. This was better before, this was, this, this is, you know, we got some kurban and that was great, but overall we've gotten nothing but trouble and now we have a divided community. Let's all go back to the old ways. By the way, we can't speak Arabic, we're not learning Arabic, and we prefer to speak Cham and pray in Cham, and that's the way that we've always done things, that's how we understood things, so let's, let's go back. And, and that's effectively what ends up happening, is that the Hakim in 2016, returns to Imam Sam practice, um, and he basically rejects any further uh, influence, telling him what to do. And most of the families that converted with Bilal, the 20 families, only about three or four families remained with Bilal. Most of them came back to, to the Imam Sam uh, community. So here's some pictures. So this, this, is, th this is what you call a mosque in Cambodia. See, it's made of uh, concrete, fantastic. Uh, and this is what it should look like in the interior. Um, if I could show you the old mosque, one thing that's also indicative here that it's, it's, it's a very subtle point, but it's not subtle if you're a Cambodian Muslim. Um, if you look at these folks uh, praying here, you'll see these blue scarves, and he has it wrapped around his head, there's a red one. That checkered pattern uh, of textile is called a krama. In, in Cambodian, and it's it's sort of like, it's th the Krama is the Cambodians what the kafia is to Palestinian people. It is like their national uh, symbol. So it, it is it is a a symbol that's closely associated with Khmer Buddhists, uh, which Imam Sans use freely amongst themselves, which is one thing that when you go to the uh, to the modern mosque, what they call modern mosque, which is the Orthodox mosque, um, you know these guys. These guys here would not be caught dead wearing a krama. Okay, that's that, that's that's a, that's a that's a, a patently non-Islamic uh, symbol. They might wear a krama later on, but not at prayers. Uh, here is the old mosque, <coughs> which was built in 2011. Okay, and this was built without any without any conditions, and this is what is what their what their school looks like. And if you can see, uh, they're teaching in a combination. They use Arabic script, but they also use Cham script. They have their own script of their own. Uh, and instruction is, is basically all in Cham. Even when they're studying Arabic, they're really just, they're just reciting Arabic and then talking about it in Cham. They're not, they're not, they're not speaking Arabic amongst themselves in the school. Uh, then there's the new mosque, which is a little bit bigger, a little bit nicer, uh, 2014. Um, and here you see a combination of books, uh, mostly written in uh, Khmer, which is up there is in Khmer, and then this is in Cham, but using Arabic script so that uh, the Cham of the other group would use their own Indian uh, pre-Islamic Cham script, whereas here you're gonna use Tahumsa, um, uh, which is a, a Arabized form of Cham, using lots of uh, Malaysian words because Malaysian is fancy. So like, so the word Tahun is, should be Tun in, in Cham, but Tahun sounds nicer because that's how Malays say it. Um, so I think the conclusion here is that what's really interesting is that you have a, a, a question of gift giving across cultures, okay? But it, you know, and one thing that's important is that all Cambodian social institutions function as networks of patron and clientage, all of them, okay? That's starting to change, there's more bureaucracy now, there's more modernization, but effectively patron-client relations are where it's all at. Um, and this is true of both Khmer and the Cham people. A lot of people will ask me, um, are Muslims discriminated against in Cambodia? No, they're not discriminated against. The thing is that Muslims and, and non-Muslims belong to different patronage networks. So when, when you talk to Muslims who feel that they don't have a lot of opportunities in life, 
their complaint is not that Khmers discriminate. Their complaint is they are not, they are not close enough to the Mufti. Or they're not close enough. Uh, it's, the, it's always the imam's nephew that gets the money for blah, blah, blah. Or that gets the scholarship for this and this. And not me because I'm not related to any of the imams or any of the actors. So these are people who have two parallel gift-giving patron-client cultures, but which are structurally identical. And yet they were not able to bridge the gap. This, this guy, Dasso, the, the guy who, who converted, he's a Khmer, he converted to uh, Islam. All of his knowledge of patron-client networks from years of growing up as a Khmer did not seem to help him. You know, they start just giving gifts right away and then making demands later. If you understand how in, in, in proper patron-client relationships uh, or any other situation, how gifts work, gifts don't work that way. You don't, you know, I don't have a gift for anybody in this room right now, for example. Um, you know, you give gifts at birthdays, you give gifts at graduations, you give gifts at retirements. You know, these are the punctuation marks of life. Something happens, then a gift happens. And that gift marks a sort of circle of continuity by which you can then expect the next thing to happen. You know, hopefully you'll have another birthday. Hopefully you'll get another job. Hopefully you'll, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, so if you think about gifts as a way of communicating, when you just show up at a village and you start, you know, you just start giving gifts to people who don't know why you're, even why you're giving them the gift. Um, you know, it's like beginning a sentence with, you know, a, a, an exclamation mark. And that's not grammatical, um, except in Spanish, but, but, but we're very generous people. Um, so, and so I think here, um, so even though they both have these patron-client cultures, they, they're, they're failing to achieve this. And I think to, to conclude, to come to the conclusion, uh, is this a question of, um, what was the is empire building or philanthropy. philanthropy? I don't think you can uh, you can say that the Saud, the Lao, Hakim, or all these people were acting in bad faith. Everything, everyone seems to be acting in good faith, and they seem truly bewildered by why other people don't do what they think they're supposed to be doing. So, I mean, it's an act of philanthropy in the sense that people really are um, making these arrangements, giving up time, giving up money, giving up effort in order to do this. But, you know, when you conduct philanthropy with very little information, and, and these people just did, 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 just did not do their homework. Uh, there's, there's lots of other things going on. For, for, for while this was happening, there was a tremendous schism in the Imam San community because of their leadership in another village, which was affecting all of the villages down the line. If they had known that, that's something that they, but he never knew that. So, so, so I, I, I'm going to earn the side of uninformed philanthropy is what this is. And, uh, and, and by the way, this has implications not just for, for this, but for all kinds of development projects. I mean, there's always, you know, some USAID project or some uh, Singaporean, uh, you know, help for a broad project that is, doesn't have enough information to actually get it, get it done the way that needs to be. Um, so I think with that, I'm going to end. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, all right. You. Thank you very much, everyone. Dr. Herman Latif, uh, who obtained his PhD from Utrecht University in the Netherlands in 2012. He was a research fellow at the Royal Netherlands <coughs> Institute of Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies in 2013. Uh, he is now a lecturer at the Faculty of Islamic Studies at Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta. Uh, his latest publications include uh, Addressing Unfortunate Wayfarer, Islamic philanthropy and Indonesian migrant workers in Hong Kong. Uh, that came out in 2017 in the Austrian Journal of Southeast Asian Studies and he's widely published on uh, much that is relevant to today's uh, workshop. So without further ado, sir, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for everyone here. I'm uh, very delighted to meet you all. And today I would like to talk about the Islamic charities in Indonesia, in particular, uh, it's about the rule of uh, charitable organization from uh, Middle East or from, or from Gulf countries in Aceh. Uh, my title is Preserving Gulf Charities, Orphans and Islamic Education in Post-Reconstruction Aceh. Okay. Uh, <coughs> my 
presentation here uh, today is actually based on my uh, research uh, that I conducted uh, in 2008, 2010, 2015, 2016, when I frequently come to Aceh for my observations about the local charity, actually. Uh, but then uh, I come across with the uh, you know, active rule of uh, charitable organization from overseas countries, not only from the Middle East, but also from the West. So Aceh, Aceh uh, became the influx of uh, number 100 uh, NGOs or charitable organization from all over the world, yeah. from Europe, from United States, including from the Middle East, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, and so forth and so on. So, uh, but in my presentation, I would like to highlight how uh, charitable organization, in particular coming from uh, Gulf countries, uh, preserve or the local how the local community preserve uh, the presence of uh, charitable organization from Gulf countries. Because if we come to Aceh and today uh, or this year. Uh, we still find uh, some organizations, uh, charitable organizations coming from Gulf countries uh, still operating in Aceh, despite the fact that they witness a transformation in its institution. Uh, because I came to Aceh four times from 2008 until 2016, I, I came to the same organization but uh, coming to different office. In the past, when uh, the board members or the leaders of those charities still controlled by uh, their headquarters in the Middle East, they could run, uh, rent very big house, you know, big uh, office and so forth. But later on, so the office becomes smaller, smaller, smaller. <laughs> and finally, uh, right now, I found that some organization, not only from the Middle East, but also from uh, UK, like the Muslim Aid or Islamic Relief, uh, yeah, of course, Jakarta Charities, uh, they ran a small, uh, small, not only rent now, they owned okay, a small house or small office, but they owned. In the past, they ran very big house. So uh, this uh, kind of uh, transformation uh, institutionally, institutionally of uh, charity or NGOs in Aceh. Of course, Aceh is still interesting because uh, in the past 10 or 5 years, they, uh, this area was very dynamic. Uh, political change uh, took place and uh, 20 years ago, for example, if we look at the situation in Aceh still, uh, influenced by the conflicts between uh, Aceh uh, free movement and Indonesian army. Okay. Uh, but then uh, in current situations, all the combatants, all the opposition uh, uh, take over the rule, or take over the power in Aceh. Uh, last year, the newly appointed, uh, the newly uh, elected uh, governor in Aceh was a former gun. Uh, who was, of course, uh, uh, 10 years ago elected uh, as uh, the governor. He re he's uh, re-elected. And uh, the other thing is the rise of uh, new institutions. In the past uh, 15 years, a lot of change in Aceh, including the rise of uh, institutions, new clinics, new schools, uh, or new educational institutions, and new local NGOs. So, uh, of course, some NGOs are closed down right now, but still uh, some, uh, some other remains exist. And uh, clinics, which in the past, uh, actually a temporary clinic set up by uh, NGOs, uh, Islamic charity for relief, in Aceh, but then it's transformed into a small clinic, the rent house, and transformed into clinics, and now become clinics and become hospital. So uh, this a lot of interesting things uh, taking place in Aceh in the past uh, 15 years. My question is, why now still 
about orphans. Okay, okay. Uh, the, pres the presence of international NGO was overwhelming in Aceh, working on various uh, activities, uh, relief, uh, charities, and uh, development project. Yeah. And uh, as I said before, in the post-reconstruction uh, Aceh, or even during reconstruction of Aceh, a lot of policies made by the government, uh, healthcare, for example, Aceh issues the JKA, uh, Jaminan Kesehatan Aceh. So it's very kind of uh, universal healthcare for Aceh Nice. Once you get the uh, ID card of Aceh, you can get free uh, services. Okay. Uh, but then another governor changed the policies, and so from Jakarta also changed the policies of uh, healthcare insurance. So lots of uh, issues uh, politically about it, this one. Education, scholarship. A number hundreds of Achenese uh, went to overseas, to United States, to UK, to Australia, and uh, Europe. They are uh, financed by different uh, agencies, uh, uh, both locally and internationally, to pursue their studies, a master, PhD, and so forth and so on. Uh, as I said before, temporary uh, emergency shelters have been transformed into orphanages, for example, into uh, new villages and into new clinics. Here is some uh, pictures of the uh, Islamic charitable organizations like uh, Qatar Charity, Islamic Relief, uh, Muslim Aid, uh, and then uh, Asian Muslim Charity uh, Foundation, so as well as uh, what is the uh, OIC Alliance here, this one, so OIC Alliance. And then Kinderhut, uh, Kinderhut. I, uh, I visited Kinderhut last year. Uh, <coughs> so this is, uh, these are some uh, examples of NGOs. Of course, I will discuss only a few uh, in today's presentation. My question is, how are Tsunami Orphans project in particular preserved and why? What are the challenges faced uh, or opportunity gained by charitable organization from uh, originating from petrodollar countries to work directly with the communities. Uh, I raise this question because if you come frequently, you know, uh, you know, if you come to Aceh during December, in December, for example, they will celebrate, uh, memo memorize uh, what's going on in the past or uh, the memories of uh, a tsunami. Uh, my my concerns is about the memory of tsunami uh, still preserves by the communities, including by the NGOs. So the orphans or the uh, the, the title of the orphan is tsunami orphans still. But you know, tsunami took place uh, hit Aceh in 2004, and now it's in 2018, right? So 10 years, uh, eight, uh, 12 years already, and. Those who are considered uh, open, yeah, 12 years ago, okay, now it's already uh, major. <laughs> I know, I mean, uh, it's already uh, become a gentleman, you know, walking somewhere and, and, and doing something, create something, or even working with the government. Uh, but still, the memory of tsunami is still preserved, and uh, Islamic charitable organizations still working on open still. What is amazing, one NGO, let's say uh, OIC Alliance, uh, OIC Alliance was established by, uh, okay, uh, before, before I come to a uh, discussion about the uh, NGOs. Okay, now we can highlight the issue of uh, tsunami, in, uh, sorry, orphans in Islam. Of course, Islam pay, uh, the Quran pay attention to the issues of uh, uh, orphans, yeah. There's a uh, Quran uh, Surah uh, Al Maun. Uh, here I, I put uh, the translation, the English translation, old English translation. Arayta Ladi Yukadibu Bidin, Fadalika Ladi Yadu Al Yatim. So uh, this is about the <coughs> Have you seen the one who denies the recompense, uh, recompense sense? Well, that is the one who drives away the orphans. So 
orphan has a special position in Islam and Muslims should protect them. Okay. Once you abuse orphans, so this kind of uh, denying religion as a whole, for example, in Islam. Uh, but again, after 12 years of uh, tsunami, uh, some NGO is still working on these issues. Uh, and I found that uh, there is a change from tsunami orphans okay, into casual orphans, <laughs> ordinary orphans, orphans from, or from uh, different uh, village uh, in, in Aceh, and preserved and uh, supported by uh, international NGOs, uh, international uh, Islamic charitable organization that I will discuss later. The other one is uh, there are two types uh, of uh, how a charitable organization working on this issue. Uh, in the past, they, they had a lot of uh, orphanage, yeah. but, but then some uh, organization changed the policy. They finance orphans without establishing orphanage. So this, uh, uh, the, the orphans still with their families, yeah. uh, <coughs> but they get support from the NGOs. Okay, this is example of uh, Qatar charity. Yeah, Qatar charity uh, plays a pivotal role in in uh, providing uh, aid for Muslim communities, uh, not only in Aceh but also in other part of Indonesia. Uh, they support uh, educational institutions, yeah, es establishing mosques, uh, water. Uh, clean water and so forth and so on, including uh, the orphans. Uh, this is uh, how to Okay, uh, this one is, uh, in Indonesia we call it ruko. Uh, ruko means, uh, what is, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, they they bought uh, uh, this uh, what's it, a complex uh, uh, side of the complex, uh, the building. They put the Qatar charities, and this is the, the office, the local office now in Aceh. And uh, every month uh, they will invite the orphans uh, from different village that they have finance to come to uh, this uh, office and to. Uh, to have a supervision, including uh, to recite the Quran, uh, to pray together, and so forth and so on. Uh, what's uh, surprising to me, uh, <coughs> well, I come there to see that uh, because a lot of gas here, and in front of this office, a lot of motorcycles, and there are new motorcycles, and good. The families who brought these orphans, okay, uh, waiting here. And, and they drive uh, by motor, they are on motorcycle. I mean, they are able to buy a motorcycle. Uh, and uh, this is, if we look at the profile of the data used by those charities, quite interesting because they finance not only 10,000, uh, 10, 100, or 200, they finance thousands of orphans. Okay. Uh, About 3,000, like uh, the other ones, like uh, this one, uh, which is, uh, OIC Islands, uh, set up uh, in partnership between OIC and IDB, uh, Islamic Development Banks, okay. Uh, that's uh, support for uh, at least 5,000, 5,000 uh, in Ate. Uh, they they uh, regularly okay. They uh, regularly send money to the family uh, to transfer the cash uh, to the family. Uh, use uh, Islamic bank. Okay, so uh, the the orphan can use uh, this money to finance uh, their study to support their study. Some program also were provided to support very diligent, uh, very smart guys, uh, orphans, uh, to send them to st study in very good university in Java. 
oke okay, at University of Indonesia, University of Gajah Mada, University uh, Institute of Agriculture in Bogor and so forth. So uh, it was very dynamic. However, unlike others, uh, NGOs uh, or IC Islands uh, uh, is acting as a grand making. Okay. Uh, just play supervision and uh, uh, this NGO channel the money to other uh, local NGOs in Indonesia and they just uh, monitor uh, how the, the NGOs uh, use the money and support and so on. So, uh, <coughs> another point I would like to make is how partnership is made between those charities and Indonesian government. Uh, this interesting uh, situation in Aceh because since 2010, many NGO should register okay, in Jakarta. Those who are already there should be registered again in Jakarta and they clarified by the government. And they have to set up office in Jakarta. Because in the past, they just set up office in Aceh, they just set up in, uh, in other regions, but they have to have uh, headquarter in Jakarta and they will uh, the, the permission uh, will be renewed within two years so uh, and therefore I, I mentioned before it's a lot of change yeah uh, how they they uh, provide office in in, in the Aceh in Aceh region uh, Yeah, well, you see that since 2006, uh, OIC Alliance uh, has uh, financed 14,000 orphans. They put the orp who are the orphans. They are under uh, 14th yeah, age, the age, and then they will be financed until they accomplish their studies in high school. After high school, so they will see the situation, whether or not the funding from the Middle East, from Dubai, U United Emirates, or uh, other region from Kuwait, uh, decide to continue. Okay. But normatively, uh, basically they just uh, finance, uh, their study will be financed until high school. But there's also some case when, uh, because the, the donors is not only institutions but also families yeah, and even persons in the Middle East. Let's say once a person's donor as from the Middle East uh, wanted to to finance uh, the former okay, uh, children in Aceh uh, to pursue their study in uh, higher education, they will call the institution, uh, how about my, my child and the OS still uh, looking for a job and so forth. Okay, just continue study at the university, I will finance it. So there are some cases when uh, persons in the Middle East also came to uh, contact the agencies and finance uh, the student. And they never meet yeah, each other until now. So that is interesting. Uh, here are the other ones. Uh, the origins of the kinder heart is uh, from the United uh, uh, Arab Emirates and uh, it was set up by some professional and doctors from Dubai and I believe it's from uh, Indian origins and Sri Lanka who are uh, working in, in Dubai and took initiative to deliver aid to Aceh and Sri Lanka and uh, in the beginning they set up a kinder hut village yeah, in Aceh Besar, so about uh, 30 kilometers from uh, Banda Aceh. Uh, this is not my photo. Actually, within two weeks, I I <laughs> look for my, my own pictures that I forget to coding. Yeah, a thousand pictures I didn't find it my own, uh, including my uh, visit to this uh, uh, kinder hut. In so uh, this uh, uh, they they bought land uh, and then uh, setting up uh, fourteen houses for children as well as for the uh, destitute uh, uh, women. So they will invite the assisted women from a poor uh, women from uh, poor families uh, invite to come to this, and they will be educated how to take care of the children. And while 
uh, and they learn something in this place, they also uh, become the mother of the, the orphans. They send those uh, guys to schools, yeah, the children to schools. And uh, in the l two days ago, I, I found that uh, some of the orphans uh, got a good achievement yeah, in their study. So they promote a lot of things. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, unlike, okay, unlike other uh, NGO, this NGO is not transforming into, uh, okay, sorry. This NGO is led not by Indonesian. Those who is in charge in this is from India. Of course, says we used to be work, uh, working in Dubai, and then they asked to in charge there. But other NGO is uh, led, uh, control, organized by local people. Only this, uh, you know, Kinder Hut is uh, controlled by, by uh, foreigners, uh, directly led by foreigners. Okay, <coughs> five minutes left. Uh, why still? Uh, Orpan is interesting. Again, I just put the picture here. 13 orphanages were shut down, closed down in Aceh. This, uh, the news is just has come out due to lack of fun. Actually, I'm still uh, searching how many, actually, how many orphans uh, exist in Aceh. That's the number I'm still looking uh, I'm still looking for. Unlike 2000, uh, before 2004, we found a lot of orphans because of the victims of the conflict between Aceh Free Movement and Indonesian Army. Uh, and then uh, in 2004 until 2010, a lot of orphans because of the tsunami. But now, still a lot of orphans. And what's the cause? Okay, because when I come to some places, the orphan came from the other villages, which are not affected by tsunami, of course. So that's uh, closed down, and they are struggling how to finance uh, those uh, guys. Okay, my conclusion is preservation of orphan project has been used as a strategy not only to fulfill local needs, but also to preserve international funding. And different types of agencies and network have been established between local NGOs in Aceh and international aid agency, agency from the Middle East. And there's also the changings of uh, organizational types of NGOs from uh, the Middle East in Aceh, which is then uh, localized, or in my word, is uh, foundationisi foundationization, uh, yayasanisasi in Indonesia. Foundation is yayasan, and then it's a localized, locally, uh, for the for foundation. <laughs> okay, that's my presentation. Thank you.